In the course of his seven years or so in exile in Antinoopolis, the provincial capital of the Thebaid, Dioscorus of Aphrodito, in addition to other writings, generated numerous documents pertinent to Roman private law. Although scholars have studied some of these as individual specimens, his entire legal oeuvre from the period of his life, this period of his life, from the late 560s into the early 570s, has never been examined in depth for what it can tell us about Dioscorus' notarial practices. P. Chiron Sparrow 2, 67151, is an important exemplar of his work. Although its legal technicalities are more complicated than this would su suggest, the piece has conveniently been labeled as, again, quote, the will of Flavius Foibamum. He was at the time of its drafting chief doctor of Antinoopolis. By the will's most important terms, Foibamon installs his underage sons as heirs, leaves by legacy one aurora of Vineland with its operating equipment to the monastery of Appa Jeremias, provides in detail for his own burial, though reaffirming her title to his gifts to her at marriage, ensures that his wife receives nothing from the estate proper, turns over his charitable hospital to his brother, <coughs> disinherits other family members, provides a legal guardian for his sons, asks an aunt to sell off property in payment of a loan, entitling her to retain any profits from the transaction, bequeaths also to the monastery of Abba Yeramayas a boat that he has acquired through purchase, arranges to pay off a debt, and finally provides by legacy until his maturity annual provisions for a mysterious foster child. In P. Chiron Mespero 67151, Foibamon's will takes over 300 lines of text to spell out these dispositions. According to Leslie McCool, it is Dioscorus' longest work in prose. It is also one for which his editor, Jean Mespero, provided by his standards an unusually long introduction and a more than usually detailed commentary, both of which, despite remaining problems, provide excellent reference points for entering into and understanding the text. That, as you know, was more than a century ago. Much more recently, McCool's rhetorical analysis in her famous book on Dioscorus from 1988, and Joël Bocam's consideration of its legal features in an article dating to 2001 are additional guides to the text. Apart from these discussions, the extraction of one of, of, one of its legacies as FIRA 366 and identification of another passage as referencing novel 87 on the re revocability of bequests, for Bauman's will has not elicited sufficient discussion, perhaps because, <coughs> as Peter Van Minen has remarked, like most of, most of Di Dioscorus's legal compositions, it has not received full and careful translation into a modern vernacular language. It seemed, therefore, to be an ideal candidate for testing my abstract rhetorical question. What better aim for a papyrologist than to recreate as richly as possible for those expert and not? Using all possible clues, the dramatic moment at which the papyrus as a form of paper became a document that entered however grandly or humbly, the consciousness of history. Accordingly, instead of refocusing on the will's terms as just sketched, I will mainly look to events surrounding its commitment to writing. The procedure will at times employ R.G. Collingwood's practice of interpolation, which I interpret to mean, for present purposes, the imaginative reconstruction of what must have happened as this is implied by the fixed nodes of fact provided by the document itself. In attempting this, I will refrain from good Buddhist practice that would insist on going back to the plant itself, the life form which, after human intervention, would give to Foibamon's will its material substratum. 
It is enough to say that Papyrus was one of the mediums named in Justinian's Institutes as approved for receiving the texts of wills. On the handout, the quotations will follow in the order as they're given in the, in the paper. It does not matter, says the Institutes, whether the will is made on tablets or papyri or parchments or some other material. Obviously, for Bamon's will fulfills this loose requirement at the same time as it raises questions about how Dioscorus acquired blank papyrus for his office use, at what cost, and how this influenced what these days would be called the transaction costs of his dealings with Foibamon and his other clients. If clients is not too anachronistic a word for those who sought his services. He presumably kept records of office expenses now lost with entries for the purchase of papyrus rolls for use in drafting documents, some of them later reused for some of his poems. An immediate complication is that Foibanon's will survives in two copies. The already mentioned 67151 measures nearly 14 feet in length by a bit over a foot in width, or 31.5 centimeters to be exact. The other copy, 67152, is not quite eight feet long, and again, just a bit over a foot wide, or 30.3 centimeters to be exact. Both widths correspond to the standard roll widths of the period, but differ enough to show that they are not from the same roll. Mespero's silence on the matter suggests that their verso versos are blank, which seems strangely wasteful if these rolls with their fully inscribed rectos were brought to Aphrodito from, from, to Aphrodito from Antinoopolis for Dioscorus's future use. Possibly explanatory is that for Bamon's will, dated 15 November 570, is the last datable document attributed to Dioscorus. 67152, as we shall see, the last one assignable to his hand. Perhaps he never got around to using their empty sides. Returning to that date in November 19, uh, 570, we can try to enter the space where the will was drafted and imagine the drama surrounding its composition. The moment when it seems the message for Bamon's will met its medium in the smaller of these two grand sheets of papyrus, 67152. The evidence is slight but suggestive. In its own words, the will claims to have been composed in a demasias kai practicos topos, perhaps translated generically as a public place of business. Mespero himself was certain the phrase indicated the office of the civil governor, or prices, of the lower Thebaid, foron Thebaidas, evidenced in other documents, the hub of provincial legal activity in Antinoopolis, an obvious place of convergence for scholastici and lawyers. Note also, unless this is just a figure of speech, for Bamon himself speaks of his active life in terms of walking in the agora, badizo et agoras, the Greek equivalent of the Latin forum. As the city's chief doctor, his own office may also have been there amid those of uh, the lawyers and provincial bureaucrats, the governor himself, his commentarienses, esceptores, numerari, and, and so forth. Under ordinary circumstances, we would expect an effort on the part of the testator to effect on this occasion a dramaturgical as well as legal success. The latter mostly dependent on his legal expert, the former on himself. The very existence of the will assures the presence of at least two parties. First, of course, the testator for Bamon. Uh, second, of course, Dioscorus himself. To take Foy Bamon first, he was a salaried chief doctor, presumably therefore in charge of other doctors. The son and successor to a chief doctor now deceased, he was an overseer and owner of a charity hospital inherited from his father. 
a property owner both by inheritance and personal acquisition. His holdings included agricultural land together with ownership of the capital equipment needed to work it. He was a speaker of Greek with a claim to literacy, at least as far as signature literacy is concerned and probably beyond. He was present in sound of mind and body, so he says, but contemplating death's inevitability in sententious terms. As the will's preamble uh, proclaims, the end of all things, including the race of mortals, is death, and this it is utterly impossible to escape. But for those who are thoughtful, to think ahead and prepare for it is the most blessed of all things. I'm not sure I agree. Um, <laughs> uh, responsible and thoughtful, for Baumont had married a virgin bride, now his noble wife, Eogana Stockton, who has borne him sons to an uncertain number. They are much loved, philaetatois, pros philestatus, pothenus, and very young, nepios a phalaxi, young enough to require a guardian should their father die. Foibamo and his wife may therefore themselves have been relatively young in AD 570. And surely, as we learn throughout the will, for Bamon was a man of religious sentiment and conviction, concern for his son's salvation, and somewhat actively involved with the local monastery and its leading monks. Our other principal to Phaedamon's will, Dioscorus of Aphrodito, away from home, was probably in his mid-40s, if not pushing 50. In addition to other documents credited to, him, credited to him as a legal expert, he is generally considered the author of Fort Bamon's will. But the issue is not quite so simple. One complication is the will's survival in two versions. A third party, an anonymous, therefore comes into play, he being the one responsible for the more complete of the two surviving versions the one now numbered 67151. The other, 67152, Maspero assigned nearly certainly to the hand of Dioscorus himself based on its similarity to page three of P. Cairo Maspero I, 67002, part of the grand but infuriating complaint to the Duke of the Thebaid, framed in the first person plural in behalf of the aggrieved villagers of Aphrodito. <laughs> because the abbreviations in 67152 are resolved in 67151, and because the superlinear and marginal insertions of 67152 are copied properly into and onto the lines of 67151, 67152, is, right, is rightly taken as the incomplete draft version of the will, 67151, despite various minor mistakes, is the fair copy. The online images further reveal that the anonymous's hand is, after all, though perhaps only to my eye, the more elegant of the two, closer to the ideals of the Byzantine chancery style, and, and the survival of a protocol at the start of the roll on which 67151 was written would seem to clinch its claim to be the authoritative or definitive text. This conclusion, however, is undercut by Maspero's suspicions that this protocol, evident on the image, I hope, all right, was cut away from another document and glued to this one, a practice noted in novel 44 a sentence two, as a troublesome source of forgeries. In any case, I think we conclude, can conclude that the anonymous need not have been present at the drafting of Foy Bamon's will. He copied it later on, laboriously moving from eye to hand and back, r rather than from dictation. Whether he was responsible for the foreign protocols pasting on is indeterminable. As far as copies are concerned, 
Note that Justinian, in his Institutes, approves the making of extra ones for wills, as long as they follow the rules, noting especially the case of the testator about to travel by sea, navigaturus, and wanting to have copies both with him on his travels and safely preserved back home. But, continues the emperor, all kinds of pressures can suggest the same precautions. I take this passage as implying the dangers of travel by sea, the trans-provincial scope of Roman law in this period, and the chance of a will's having more than one authoritative written final version. Returning to Dioscorus's office, we see that according to the custom of the times, Dioscorus on 15 November 570 and the anonymous later on used their roles transversa carta, rolling, rotating them 90 degrees clockwise and writing top down from the former left edges of their roles. This is something that you may already have gathered immediately upon hearing the measurements given above. The practice, though requiring writing to proceed across the fibers, was certainly advantageous from planning and layout points of view, and possibly also from the economic. The result says here can be texts of many lines, each, however, being relatively short in terms of word count, because Byzantine documentary <coughs> writing tends to be so large. For Bamon presents himself as having dictated his will in Greek words, and as having ordered it to be written down in Greek letters, a claim seemingly at odds with McCool's presentation of Dioscorus as having in Foy Damon's will produced his most elaborate prose composition. <coughs> I, I say this because Foy Damon, after all, is the legal actor, uh, a fact that gives him a claim to be, or at least fictively deemed to be, the author of his own will. This is a claim reinforced by the text's opening a use of what philosopher J.L. Austin classifies as, and I quote, performative present tenses, notably those in the first person singular verbs that start in line eight with tithemi and poiumai. These are <coughs> verbs through, through which the issuing of the utterance is equivalent to the performing of an action. Verbs, that is, which invest a document with performative power as last wills and testaments traditionally do. The process of putting into written form an oral act like Foy Bamon's will must have been cumbersome and complicated. And now, as presented here, it emerges not as the product of a single author, but as a collaborative effort with dual voices, <coughs> the testators and the legal experts. <coughs> to these, we might add a third, by crediting the prolix Byzantinus or Urkundenstil itself with contributing to the formulation of the text. Or even a fourth, by the text's verbatim references to Justinian's legal works, especially from the Institutes and the Codes. Or even a fifth, if we think that the preamble on human mortality was drawn from a collection of such preambles. <laughs> Dioscorus's personal voice can <coughs> can perhaps be seen in his adaptations of the testamentary template and in his creative diction, his use of words that Foibamo himself might not have understood, like the Hapox Legomenon, Politico Praetorion, line 44, misconstrued by McCool as signifying the will's confirmation to the requirements of the city Praetorium but rightly seen by Maspero and Volcom as signifying the melding of the jus civile, politico, civil law, and jus honorarium, praetorion, uh, jus honorarium or magistrate's law, in Justinian's law of succession. For Bamon's own voice can perhaps be distinguished in his repeatedly expressed preemptive concerns for possible challenges to the interests of his heirs his beloved underage sons, his claims of modest means, despite landed interests in two places, and a 60 solidus annual, annual salary, and the clearly stated religious motivation behind some of his testamentary arrangements. 
He, of course, must be the one supplying the metadata for incorporation into the documentary template. But in this regard, three blank spaces catch the eye in ascending order of importance. At line 153, where the number of the coming, Melusse's indiction, and the word for indiction itself are lacking, though the will's dating clause in lines three to four firmly places it in the present fourth epinemesis. At lines 261 to 274, which give business instructions to the apparent beneficial financial benefit of an aunt whose name is left blank in line 261. Line 76 to 77, which appoint Fibamo and Sons as heirs without naming them. The first two blanks resist <coughs> certain explanation, but the reason for the third, as has been pointed out, may be provided by Justinian's institutes expressing a rule insisting that to guarantee the sincerity of a will and prevent fraud, heirs' names must be entered either by the hand of the testator himself or of his witnesses. Presumably, the witnesses would perform this function only if the testator himself was illiterate or otherwise incapacitated. Toward the beginning of the will, Foybamon ind indicates he will subscribe in his own letters, but his signature is lacking at the end. Likewise missing are the signatures of the witnesses, although they are introduced in precise legal form as having been summoned, seven in number, Roman citizens and ethebes coming together at one meeting and time with no other business intervening and ready to sign. Contrary to Lacoul, who treats boy as indicating those of the gymnasium, the Latin equivalents from the, Latin, from the institutes and the code so that show that these citizens simply put are puberes, i.e. of legal age. The question then is not about sixth century analogs to the classical gymnasium, but the content of Roman citizenship three and a half centuries after the Antonine Constitution. It was, of course, the testator's responsibility to convoke Rogare, his seven witnesses, but it seems this never happened in Foybamon's case. The absence of their names is a serious loss for what they might have told us about society in Antinoopolis in 570 and the network within which Foybamon functioned, probably filled with members of the lower to middling Flaviate, perhaps with useful prosopographical links and further elaboration on what is already known about Dioscorus' own networks in the provincial capital. Not only did they not sign, they never affixed their seals, a point doubly made in the text, which claims itself to be <coughs> both a semantron and an upothragida, sealing according to the institutes being a requirement of the jus honorarium, but not of the jus quirile. Without signatures or seals, it is impossible to prove that the witnesses were present when Foybamon dictated his will. Uh, and so it appears from this and other signals that neither 67151 nor 67152 can be considered an authoritative or definitive version. They are a draft and a copy that were never put to use. Part of the scrap paper Dioscorus brought home from Antinoopolis after clearing out his office. A puzzling waste and a serious obstacle to the project of reconstruction this paper announced at its start. <laughs> We can only presume that Foybamon himself took his own authoritative copy away from Dioscorus' office with blanks filled in and signatures signed. The lost authoritative version would accordingly fall into the category of what I have, I have elsewhere called known unknowns, lost documents whose existence can be conject conjectured, whose form and contents can be imagined. Meanwhile, P. Chiron Sparrow 67151 and 67152, whatever their status is, if we combine McCool's and Bocan's presentations of them, suggest a provincial Egyptian capital alert to and respectful of Roman imperial law, immersed in the rhetoric of its day, stable in its secular institutions, devout in its Christianity, 
free from the disruptions evidence for the village to which Dioscorus was about to return. In sum, and ironically, a highly cultured environment with no hint of the regime change looming three generations hence. The process of that change, owing to the current high interest in late antiquity and advances in Arabic papyrology, has become a central problem of historical papyrology today, a problem to whose treatment this conference, I am sure, will make its own significant contribution.